Okay, thanks, David. Um, what I thought I'd do today is um, talk a little bit about the research that we've done that's related to hydrocarbon development and transportation or pipeline uh, development and focus on what we can learn from existing infrastructure projects. And I'm going to talk a bit about an ex a monitoring program along an existing pipeline and give you some idea of how important those monitoring programs are and what we can learn from them and how they might be applied to other to making decisions about other projects and also designing other projects. So even though I'm going to talk about a pipeline and use that as an example, I hope that some of what I say you'll find um, it to be relevant to other major infrastructure projects and northern resource development projects as well. So pipelines aren't too much different from other linear infrastructure that we've already heard about today. They face similar challenges. Um, we have issues where we clear, when we clear the vegetation, that can cause, and the surface disturbance, and so in other words, remove that natural insulating layer we can cause the ground to warm up and we can get thawing. We also can have thermal effects associated with the pipe and depending on what's flowing down the pipe, we may have a pipe that's warmer than the surrounding ground or colder than the so surrounding ground. So we have to deal with issues of thawing and freezing and that can then cause ground movement so we can have thaw settlement, uh, frost heave, we can have instabilities in slopes and they can have impacts on the environment and also on the integrity of the infrastructure itself. And because we're dealing with variable soil conditions along a very long route, in the case of the Norman Wells pipeline, we have a route that's over 800 kilometers long, we can get different conditions along the route and we can get these differential movements. And on top of all that, we have climate change. So that then presents us with an additional challenge that we have to deal with. So as I mentioned already, we've got these variable um, terrain conditions along the route. So what that really requires us is to have good regional scale information um, on the terrain conditions. So we have to know something about the surficial materials, the ground thermal conditions, and the ground ice conditions. And we also have to consider how the conditions may change over time. So earlier this morning, one of the breakout groups, I think I came up with saying what's really important is the spatial and temporal variability of the permafrost conditions. And we have to consider that those conditions will change both in response to construction and operation of the pipeline or whatever infrastructure you're talking about, and also in response to a changing climate. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that we've done along the Norman Wells pipeline. And the um, pipeline is over 800 kilometers long. It's, it, it's completely buried in the discontinuous permafrost zone and goes from Norman Wells all the way down to northern Alberta. It's a fairly small diameter pipeline and it's what we call an ambient temperature pipeline. So there's basically no changing of the temperature along the route. And it's been operating since 1985. And just to give you some idea of sort of the regional context, this is the area where the pipeline uh, traverses. And you can see this is the, the major soil groups along the pipeline. You can see this blue stuff. This is this ice-rich, silty clay, these lacustrian sediments. So we've got lots of that nasty stuff, usually up in more the northern part of the route. And as we get further south, you can see an increase in the organic terrain. And down here, and you can see where these red bits are, is the terrain that's more sensitive to thawing. And that's where we're more likely to get thaw settlement. Now, when the um, pipeline was constructed, there was a collaborative monitoring program set up and we call it a permafrost and terrain research and monitoring program. It was a collaboration between the government and the pipeline operator, and the operator is now called Enbridge, but it was interprovincial pipelines back then. And Aboriginal Affairs was one of the main government partner in this, but the Geological Survey was also um, involved, and we really were responsible for the permafrost side of things. And the whole idea was, um, when, you, when you build something like this and you make, in the design, you're making predictions of the environmental impacts, you know, how the, the permafrost terrain will change over time. And if you have a good monitoring program, you can assess what, how good your predictions actually were. 
And you also want to monitor to see how the terrain is behaving and if you have to do any mitigation. So it, it helps the, with the environmental management of the pipeline right away. And what we can also, if we have that information that we collect during this monitoring program, it can also help us to design future projects get better and also help in the decision making and the regulatory process that's associated with those. So, oops. Um, so my um, department's main part in this um, had to do with a suite of instrumented sites. There were 23 of them originally, but we did add more over time. And these sites allowed us to examine both the thermal and terrain conditions and really investigate how the long, or what the long-term changes in permafrost conditions were in the undisturbed terrain. And to get a better understanding of the environmental impacts and also understand the how the natural conditions were changing as well. So these are what the original instrumented sites look like. We called them thermal fences. And you've heard about temperature cables, thermistor cables. So there are thermistor cables installed on the right-of-way at varying distances from the pipe, and also one off the right-of-way in the undisturbed terrain. And you can get an idea of what it looks like. And here are the location of all the sites here. And I'm just going to show you some of the types of data that we collect and what we, what we could do with it. And this is some of the ground temperature data. So what we could do was compare the changes in ground temperature beneath the right-of-way, and that's uh, the red lines here. So this is the original temperature shortly after construction, and this is a more recent, you know, over 20 years later. And the blue is the temperatures um, over time in the undisturbed area, and you can see that uh, beneath the right-of-way, things warmed up a lot more, and we get an increase in thaw depth. And these are just other examples. This is, this is right at the pump station in Norman Wells. This is farther down, getting closer to Wrigley. And um, we go farther south into much warmer terrain. You can see the changes are maybe less and less, and that's where we've got this ice-rich material, and it's, it's at zero degrees, and the energy now is going into actually melting all that ice. And in some places, as you can see over here, we actually did lose the permafrost where it was very thin. So we can compare what goes on in the disturbed and undisturbed areas. We can look at what the impact of all that warming is. So we can look at what the change in thaw depth has been over time, and we can also make measurements of the ground surface elevation and look at how much settlements occurred. Uh, this is again up near the, right at the north end of the pipeline. We can go right towards the south end of the pipeline. This is a uh, peatland terrain. We've done surveys across the right of way, and again, we can look at the settlement that's occurred over time. And we can use that information to come up with thaw strains for various terrain types. We can also look at different right-of-way preparation techniques, and this is a peatland in the area around G. Marie Creek, and you heard about that the other day from uh, Fabrice and uh, Jen. They talked about this area. And these are these little islands of permafrost, these peat plateaus that are surrounded by these fens, and this was a site that was set up in one of those fen peat plateau uh, transitions, and it had very warm and very thin permafrost, and they leveled out the peat plateau when, when they constructed the pipeline right away and removed a lot of the peat. And you can see that there was some collapsing of the peat. And through some of the observations, the temperature measurements, and you can see here that that very thin permafrost did thaw out over time. And you can see how the peat's collapsing into the ditch. And it also collapsed into the, into the fan. So it gives us some insights into, well, maybe we better not do that to avoid these kinds of effects. We can also look at the performance of mitigation techniques, and this is an example of one of these wood chip insulated slopes to try that where the wood chips were placed on the slope to try and minimize the amount of thaw. Um, this, the the, the uh, site right at the top of the slope is not doesn't have any wood chips, and this gives you an idea of the thaw depths. So red is the deeper thaw depth. And where we don't have the wood chips, things warmed up a lot more. Where we down here on the slope where we had the wood chips, it kept things cooler. And so that you don't see from the temperature uh, readings as much of a change between 
the sites on the right of way and off the right of way um, due to that wood chip insulation. So it's kept, kept the thaw depths from penetrating too deeply. Now the other thing we were able to do, because we had all these temperature cables off the right of way, is to have a look at what, how the natural conditions were changing. And we know in this region that we've had an increase in air temperature. And we've all, you know, we've, you've seen these kinds of figures already this week. So what we could do is we, we have this long-term data set, and it's now actually about 28 years uh, long, and this is just one of the figures we published for our IPY project. We could then take those records in the undisturbed terrain and look at how the permafrost is changing. And you can, whoops, back here. Um, you can see that the changes have been a little bit more. We've had an increase in temperature of a couple of tenths of a degree per decade. As we get to the really warm permafrost at the south end of the pipeline route, you can see we don't see much of a change in temperature. It's sitting right next to zero degrees. You've got all that ice. All the energy has to go into melting all that ice that's in the ground, and eventually you'll kick it over zero degrees. But it's very hard to kick it over zero degrees till you get rid of the ice. So we've got some idea of what the baseline conditions are doing from, from the data that we've collected. So we know that things warm up beneath the right of way so that the construction and operation of the pipeline has got something to do with those changes. But we've also seen that maybe in the, the undisturbed terrain, we're also seeing an increase in ground temperatures. So what we were able to do with this extensive data set that we have is to combine that with modeling studies to look at how the relative importance of a changing climate and of that disturbance on the right of way. So just, I'm not going to go into the details of how we did this, um, but basically you find a smart person like I have down the hall from me, Dan Riseborough, and he helps you do this. Um, but what we did is say, well, what if we just had a changing climate? And this is the increase in thaw depth that we might expect at a site that's, you know, just slightly below zero degrees. Now, what if we kept the climate stable and we just got rid of all the trees? Well, there's what our thaw depth would do. So we would get a really big change in surface temperature when we cleared the vegetation, removed the organic layer, so we get quite a big increase in thaw depth, much bigger than we would with this gradual change in climate. And then the next thing we did was say, well, let's put the two of those together, and that, this is what we would get. And the thicker line there is where we would start to get a talic forming, so the active layer wouldn't freeze back in the wintertime. So now we're basically degrading the permafrost. So this helps us to explain what we see in our observations, but also helps us to predict what might happen in the future. And the other thing we could do would say, well, what if the vegetation starts growing back on the pipeline right away? What effect does that have? Well, if we don't have a changing climate, well, it might slow things down and eventually maybe stabilize that, the, um, the active layer. But if we have this slow, gradual increase in air temperature, well, yeah, the vegetation comes back, but we're still going to see a deepening of thaw. So we can't really prevent it. And we, we did this modeling up for different situations, and this is the example up near, Nor you know, for the colder permafrost like we might get at Norman Wells. But the other thing I wanted to show you here is not only does that clearing on the right of way impact the, uh, the uh, thermal regime beneath the right of way, it can also extend off the right of way. So I think somebody mentioned the other day about horizontal transport board of heat as well as vertical. So we had a look at that because we ran a two-dimensional model. And what I just wanted to show you here is this is the percent of the temperature change that we'd see off the right-of-way that's maybe due to the effects of the clearing on the right-of-way. So if we're fairly close to the edge of the right-of-way, maybe five meters away, we'll see that there's a much greater effect of the clearing than maybe when we're 20 meters away. So the environmental effects can spread off the right away. And that's important because if we're trying to put in a borehole or a temperature cable where that's our, you know, we want it to be our control site, we might, we need to know where we should put it so it's not affected by the right away clearing. So if we could try and bring some of these things together, one of the things that we found from this long-term monitoring that we've done and through the, 
um, the modeling studies as well, is they do show how important that terrain disturbance is. And they can, in fact, outweigh the climate change effects, especially during those first 10 or 15 years um, that the pipeline was in operation. But the climate warming becomes much more important over time. So it may be more gradual, but it becomes more important um, over longer periods of time. So it's, it's really important to consider the combined effects of the environmental disturbance associated with the infrastructure and climate change when you're trying to design these things. And also, you know, that'll inform mitigation that you may put in there as well, because it's very hard to mitigate something if you don't know what's causing it. And, you know, you have to consider both those things, especially when we're talking about major infrastructure or infrastructure we want to last for long periods of time. Oops. Now, the other thing that we got all of, uh, out of this is that the effective monitoring programs are such essential to help us to assess environmental impacts, to monitor infrastructure performance, and also became, it became very valuable in assessing climate change impacts. So we were able to build up a really long data set, and it's a very unique data set that helped us to do that. Now, doing all this is not you know, that great if that information that we generated from this program is not out there for others to use. And I think we did a fairly good job and we're fairly proactive at getting information and data sets out there. And perhaps that had to do with the collaboration and having government involved. And so the results can be used to not only pr um, improve the design of future projects, but also help in the decision making um, process as well. So this information that we collected was used for the McKenzie gas project and also helped in the environmental assessment process. The other thing that's important is that these monitoring programs can also contribute to regional networks and can help us in improving our baseline information. And we kind of use that same model. And on this graph here, this is just the ground temperatures along the McKenzie Valley. And the uh, red dots are mostly these sites along the pipeline that we've had operating for several years. The blue dots are ones we put in a few years ago. And you've seen that map with all the colored dots on it that everybody's shown. I'm not going to show you the whole map of Canada. I'm just going to show you one part of it. And this is our sort of our ground temperature profile through the McKenzie Valley. So we can build on that stuff we did along the pipeline to build up our baseline knowledge. So any monitoring program you have for a development project, if you can make that data available, it can help in understanding the regional baseline or the regional environmental framework. And we kind of use that model for other corridors as well. Um, we took advantage of existing boreholes that we could put cables down along the Alaska Highway. And this just shows you what the um, ground temperature profile is along the Alaska Highway corridor in the northern section. And these data are the data that will that uh, Bronwyn and Fabrice mentioned, these are the boreholes and we can help them with some of their vulnerability studies with this information. And some of the other work that we're doing, it can help us to, uh, yep, um, to uh, better do um, hazard mapping and these kinds of things as well. So there's lots of advantages to these monitoring programs and building up these long-term data sets. And I think that's it. Thanks, Sharon. Um, time for one question, if any. Anything on the web? No. Yeah, please. Bob, Bob Van Dyken. Um, I can see that sort of we're looking at implications probably in the warm permafrost over the course of a, a pipeline's life. Is work being done, for example, on spills, spill cleanup, those kinds of things? and examining whether we need to look at different techniques or different monitoring in terms of in permafrost versus uh, melting permafrost and changing conditions? Yeah, and that's not my area of expertise, so I, we're not doing anything on that, but I know others have looked at uh, spills and, and you know, hydrocarbon spills and, and in frozen ground, and there have been studies, I think folks at Environment Canada and NRC are, have looked at those kinds of things.